so this is um, this is a talk about your research, and the pun is absolutely intended um, because it's um, it's your museum, not just the your museum. Um, and of course, most of you need no introduction to the your museum sitting behind me, and to the fact that that is named for our esteemed founders of the museum, um, namely um, Percy and Annie Your. Um, named since 1984 thereabouts actually for them because before that it was called the Museum of Greek Archaeology. Um, I won't have a chance today to mention everything about the recent research. Um, Catherine, I won't even talk about Winklemania except this one mention of it, um, which of course so filled our time from 2017 to 18 and continues to be of interest to us um, as well as to Catherine and various students. Um, but for starters I want to highlight some of the research done by our MA students in 2019, actually, um, in, in creating some interpretation for our newer objects. We have here Sam James's text, well, not the text, but he wrote a text on the so-called Homan tablet, um, shown at left, which we bought in 2018 in remembrance of Marjorie Homan. And um, Madeline Butcher, um, who's now moved on um, to a good museum job, actually, wrote a text on Wilfred the Chinese Camel, donated by the Rado family back in 2016. Wilfred is still a work in progress. And if some of you haven't seen him, it's because it's a bit of a challenge to find a permanent home for him in our display. His space in our spotlight case has been taken for now by the new acquisition, however, of a um, mid 20th century bronze head of Percy Ure, our founder. And this was donated last year uh, by the Ure family. Um, and our undergraduate student, Chloe Gardner, researched last summer in the archives and in the Berkshire Re Record Office as part of her uh, study in preparation as part of a, a placement uh, module, actually. Um, she created a sculpture trail called Beyond the Ure and um, there you can read all about it and all the other sculptures and casts that we have in and around the Ur Museum and in fact the entire Edith Morley building that are relevant to the history of the collection. Anyway, she discovered that, that it was made by um, a chap called Yanis Athena, um, uh, who seems to have been a student, um, but also seems to have been a pseudonym, an artistic pseudonym. So I, I just throw that out in case anyone you know, knows anything about artists at the art school um, and could find any more information about who the real, the real Yannis Athena is. If we go back to the history of the museum, in which Dr. Amara Thornton, of course, needs no introduction to you, and I'm speaking very much on her behalf for a few slides here. Um, she's been working as our research officer, and as part of that has rewritten in the last year or so the history of the museum because of um, expert trolling through the year museums and the university's extensive archives. The history, or rather the development of the museum, is here encapsulated in this useful chart that she made. Um, I'm going to show it to you again in a few minutes. But before the university had a classics department, or even professor, namely Percy Ure, there was what has been described as the nucleus of an archaeological collection at University College Reading, as it was then called, consisting primarily of some Egyptian holdings donated by Lady Petrie in 1909 or 10, and a little bit more on her later. From 1914 to 1919, as well as um, the war, of course, there was the evolution of a Romano-British museum, encouraged not least by the acquisition of some artifacts from Donald Atkinson's excavations at Lowbury Hill. Here is a view of Lowbury Hill, um, as approached from the Ridgeway, actually. And, and it was an important site for our first curator, Annie Ure, who as a student um, cycled out there from Chelsea, from the train station in Chelsea, to see the excitement and obviously sparked her interest in archaeology. Um, and it was recounted in a barely audible recording of hers that we've managed to hold on to in a 1968 talk to the Atrabates. That's the old name of the Classic Society. Um, I'm going to show it to you. But Amara incorporated a snippet of that recording into one of her posts on your roots at curiosity.org. That's our research pages. And in which um, Annie Yur explains a bit about the excavation. Um, that, that, that was um, found at Lowbury Hill, two skeletons, male and female, um, and that they came um, to 28 Portland Place um, down um, on the London Road campus, in fact, where they were displayed in a Museum of Archaeology or a Museum of History and Archaeology. It's called both names. 
And Annie's comments explain um, some of the rest of this chart, in fact, whereby even before the move to the Faculty of Letters and Social Sciences and its constituent departments um, up to the White Knights campus, where we are now, or would be where we virtually are, um, the Romano-British Museum had split from the Year Museum, despite Percy Year's proposal for, quote, establishing something that would ultimately deserve the name of a school of ancient and medieval history. And the earlier wish of Principal William McBride Childs to see the scattered archaeological collections displayed in the same place where the so-called intelligent visitor, that is a quote from Childs, could appreciate them as much as so-called scholars and students, and further acquisitions would be possible. A document penned by Annie Year in the Year Archives that Amar has found, which is not the only document Annie Year penned entitled the, Year, the Museum of Greek Archaeology, indicating the history of the museum, um, she suggests that the Museum of History and Archaeology, which was the outcome of Percy Ewer and Frank Stenton's interdisciplinary vision, was a short-lived lived affair. And while the Romano-British collections remained at number 30, Portland Place, the Greek, Egyptian, and Cypriot antiquities were moved to number 28 next door and became the Museum of Greek Archaeology, where it remained until March 1957, when it was moved up, up, up the hill, essentially, to the current location. But what of Lowbury Hill and its skeletons? The hill is literally in our backyard. Um, you can see it here in this view from Wallingford on the edge of the Ridgeway. And I hasten to add that the foreground is occupied by a very unfortunate housing development that's cropped up on what was Wallingford's Mesolithic settlement, going back five to 7,000 years. Um, but this time last year, Amara actually tempted um, some of us out to Lowbury Hill. And this year, I dare say, I got a better perspective on it as one or two of the overgrown fields around it um, have been cropped. Um, and so the high point of the hill, um, in fact, is marked by a trig marker from which I shot the panorama that you see above. So up close, it's a, a majestic unspoilt plateau of a hill from which one can see at least four counties by nowadays terms, or more importantly, geographic features the Ridgeway descending to the South Downs, the Cotswolds and the Chilterns. And I'm standing on essentially the best guess of what Annie Year would say was Mr. Lowe's burial. And what are the skeletons? Well, after Reading's archaeology department split from its history department in the early 1970s, and almost at the same time that part of Berkshire became Oxfordshire, they were transferred to the Oxfordshire County Council. We'll be glad to know that in 2017, the County Museum in Woodstock displayed Lowe himself, um, you see laid out here a complete Vacher type Anglo-Saxon warrior burial, as they say, together with his expensive grave goods arranged in an unfortunately phallocentric manner. For the women buried, not with him, but rather stuffed into the robber trench of the recycled late Roman temple in which he was buried, we call her Cariad, which I'm told is Welsh for love, um, giving her the love that maybe she didn't have for the last um, 1400 years. Well, we had our Indiana Jones moment in the county archaeological storeroom at Whitney and found that despite ample literature to the contrary, pretty much all of her is there. There's a glance at her and we're hoping that Bunny and or others along with Mary Lewis might yet tell her dark tales. Um, I hope she has some good stories too, but yeah, she can, she can talk about the chaps who obviously stuffed her in the rubber trench. Carried is certainly a hidden woman, but through Curiosity, um, the website I've referred to, other talks, a workshop, and an exhibit now online, Amara has also encouraged us and other museums to dig deeper into our archives, to tell the stories of women in archaeological museums, collectors, curators, and catalogers from the late 19th and the early 20th century, especially. I had already been working on Annie Year's story, which has now been enlarged through Ruth Lloyd's work as part of her Europe last summer. Here's Ruth with her just barely published booklet at Parliament, where this March she presented her prize-winning research on Annie Year. But along with Irama Karshi, another undergraduate, Ruth also helped with our research on and production of our first museum in a box product, which is Annie's Box. We're now embarking on making more outreach boxes, some even musical, thanks to funds just garnered from the Institute of Classical Studies for outreach work. And our work on Annie's Box, by the way, 
has encouraged um, also our um, CL3 PCA students, pioneers of classical archaeology, um, some of whom are shown on the right here, that they've explored the archives as part of their coursework and produced some really excellent blogs about the life and work of some other archaeological pioneers found in the year archives, but also stretching into other archives um, that thankfully are beginning to be available to us in an online um, environment. And we hope very much in the near future when they finish with their coursework to host their work on Curiosity. So look for that in the coming months. The Collectors, Catalogers, Curators exhibit displayed in the year last summer is now called Hidden Women Digital. It's also available at curiosity.org. Um, and it's a collaboration of your staff of volunteers, undergraduate student Angeli Badillo, and especially photographer Laura Bonetto, who created a set of associated films. And um, our assistant curator, Jane Holly, has been researching and continues to research the women um, involved, especially um, Hilda Petri. Just to give you sort of the beginning sense of it. The, the videos that we have touch very lightly on some of the information that we're getting out. Um, the idea is obviously to capture um, a broader interest, not just academics, but um, Jane, as I say, is doing yet more work on Hilda Petri and um, she, her and Amara's research interests also into our Egyptian collection have resulted in the current temporary exhibit. It explores um, the 1923 arrival of Egyptian artifacts from Liverpool. Um, obviously it's called Egypt in Reading. Uh, it, explores also interesting intersections with colonial histories relating to the excavation of Egypt. And um, it too is available online with some fascinating audio and video from Dr. Dina Resk in our history department, as well as our own Professor Rachel Mayers. And between those two temporary exhibitions was a display of the life and work of Alan Seabee, who was Reading's Professor of Fine Art and a very good friend of Annie and Percy Ure. For this exhibit, we were fortunate with um, really a windfall of a donation from Robert Gilmore, himself um, a distinguished artist, an ornithological illustrator, um, preeminent ornithological illustrator, um, who is also Seabee's grandson. And he gave us many of Seabee's watercolors, um, some of the Mediterranean painted when Seabee had leave from the university and a few hundred pounds, um, which was enough back in those days to, to travel around and, and do it through the Mediterranean, um, Egypt, as well as Greece and Italy, and a little bit of Southern France. This project was also an opportunity to collaborate with a typography department whose archives contained, amongst other things, a typescript of CB's unpublished manuscript of one of his books uh, about archaeology for children, entitled Leon of Massalia. If you've not read it yet, it is still available, all 26 illustrated chapters, redacted by our 2019 graduate, Ben Thrussell, who did a really marvelous job of transforming it. And again, that's available on Curiosity. It might yet be published also in print, along with research essays on CB's work and influence by myself, Amara, and others. Um, and again, the, the exhibit on Alan CB, well, an ab abbreviated version of it is also online. We're endeavoring to put all of our exhibits online, and we're doing that even before the lockdown. The archives are revealing ever more interesting stuff about Greek excavators, curators, etc. Alcestis Fotis, who is our Erasmus intern from Yanina, who actually just finished last week, insofar as she continued working on her research while she was in Greece. She was called back to her home country, of course, um, in light of the coronavirus. Um, but it can, it, she and also our own postgraduate, Danya Kamini, have helped Amara with the extensive correspondence between Greeks and the Euros, resulting in some more interesting curiosity postings, even one penned by Elkestis in modern Greek, I show on the right here, as well as English, if you can't understand that, um, detailing, amongst other things, the tragedies associated with the Greek Civil War from 1943 to 49. This research is resulting in a fruitful collaboration, um, perhaps in the future with funded work, um, with our old partners at Pelagios, so that's Elton uh, Barker and so forth. Um, and in the longer run, perhaps um, a, a collaboration also with our friends at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. 
Uh, and I just want to point out that Alkestis' work has already resulted in them rewriting one of their articles that was in press about a certain Athanasios Vasileou, who was a guard at some, at some of the archaeological sites in Greece in the time of the years. And as Christina Avramazaki, who's one of the curators at the National Museum, has said, now, thanks to you, our knowledge of this man, which ended at 1918, that is to say her knowledge ended at 1918, extends to 1950 with warm and heartfelt letters that shed light on his personality and personal relationship with the pioneers of Boeotia. It is so important for the history of all those people who worked, loved, and fought for Boeotia, and it seems so very appropriate for it to be included in a Boeotian festrift. In this case, she's referring to the fact that the festrift, the um, volume that it's going into, honors Vasilis Saravantinos, um, who, who was the effort of the Boeotian effort until very well until his retirement. Our next online exhibit, Music and Materiality, will in fact be our first online exhibit hosted on our new web pages at collections.reading.ac.uk, launched along with those of other university collections on the 1st of May. Um, but this work on ancient music is supported by another Europe, which we have awarded to yet another Ruth, namely Ruth Featherstone, who's a history student um, who's also studied classics and music. And Ruth will be working along with me and, fingers crossed, James Lloyd, um, also on an emerging collaboration with the British Museum called Ancient Soundscapes of the Mediterranean, seeking to inform our understanding of ancient Greek and Roman music through the analysis, reconstruction, and performance of the musical artifacts in our collections, like our aulas shown here. Um, Claudina will talk a little bit later about um, some of our other work in connection with the soundscapes of the ancient Mediterranean. But I just wanted to point out with regard to the aulas that alas, one funding application that has been delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic was to be an appeal to the Diamond Synchrotron at Harwell to enable a technical analysis of our aulas. We can only hope that once they've finished their investigation into the current virus, we can um, continue that work. But speaking of technical analysis, I'm delighted to say that we've just, in fact, on, at the end of April, submitted for publication a text that James Lloyd and I co-wrote with Kutsi Atchicek, shown here, an undergraduate intern, again last summer at the year, who was studying materials science at Imperial College. And is clearly turning his attention to ancient material science. This is a comparative analysis of the archimetric techniques used with regard to Greek cer ceramics, but on a hitherto ignored data set that's been in our collection since the 1920s. Um, seven of about 10,000 miniature vessels that were votives found at sanctuaries in and around Sparta. So good archaeological provenance, huge um, range of vessels distributed across the Sparta Museum, the British Museum, the Ashmolean Museum, Cambridge's um, Fitzwilliam, and perhaps others as well as ours. Hardly a mention of them in our archives, although there's some supporting evidence from the archives at the Ashmolean and the British Museum at least. So fingers crossed um, for that first article to be published, um, except for publication, but it also opens up, as you can imagine, great avenues for both archival and technical research. Miniature votive vessels from Sparta that we studied for that project are of course also relevant to the expertise of our postdoc, Dr. Zina Barfoot, who I think is joining us from Oslo today. Um, she is, or has been in the UK, uh, rather, on um, a mobility grant from the Norwegian Research Council. We're looking forward to welcoming her back again when they decide what she's allowed to do. Um, then she's working on a project called Cult, Memory, and Civic Identity in Caledon. The Caledon finds um, on which Zina is working are documented also in hidden archives in the Athens National Museum as well as in Denmark. And the Danish school's current work on the site is, of course, um, enlightening the site with regard to new, new finds that fit with the old finds. Materially and thematically relevant to the Euro collections and the department's wider interest in regional histories. Sina's current interest in the Caledonians' use of myth to create civic identity, moreover, is highly relevant to the themes of our forthcoming spotlight loan from the British Museum. 
would you believe that was supposed to have been launched on Friday? We were going to launch an exhibit, Troy, Beauty and Heroism. It's now been postponed to February of 2021, which a blessing in disguise is it gives us an opportunity to um, intertwine it with Zena's work. The Caledonians shared with the Trojans not only incorporation of their myths into Homer's epics, but also evidence of the connection between boar hunting, for example, and warfare. Um, through Bronze Age warriors, boar tusk helmets found at Mycenae, well, that would be the helmet, <laughs> and Caledon, at least one tusk, <laughs> as shown here, um, both for display and for battle. Hunting is perceived as an extension of war, even training for battle, and in this project will be explored also um, with regard to how the warrior ethos played a role in identity. In fact, we're planning a workshop on the use of myth in the creation of civic identity again in 2021. So look for that online if it has to be, but hopefully um, an opportunity for us to get together. Research into archaic cultures and ancient music fits not only with our interests in archaeometry, but also, as you can see, our strands of research into myth and religion, and indeed pedagogy and digital humanities. So to discuss your digital, and especially our work on Cyprus, I'm going to turn it over to our collaborator um, an education officer, Dr. Claudina Romero Mayorga, who will talk to you about some further digital inroads also into Roman material. Over to okay. you, Claudina. Thank you, Amy. Um, so, as Amy mentioned, uh, Cyprus 3D or Digital Cyprus is a project that we came up with. Um, starting from previous research, of course, uh, such as their publication in 2015, I think it was, Amy, of the Corpus of Cypriot Antiquities, um, the, the Your Museum, uh, which included all the Cypriot holdings uh, that we have, that are around 100 objects among fragments and stuff. Um, but this project uh, focuses on nine figurines we have of the Camelarga style, as you can see here. Um, they have mixed technique, the, the, the body was molded using a spinning wheel, the, the face was completely molded, and the, the arms are kind of freestyle when it comes to pottery, and they all um, hold objects in their hands, and traditionally uh, they've been interpreted as ex photos. Um, so, by using photogrammetry and 3D printing, we wanted to compare the 3D modeling approach uh, with the traditional one, which is observing, thinking, describing and drawing process. I think we've all, all been there uh, in any museum trying to draw a Greek vase and trying to capture the shape and the iconography, well, this is another way to do it uh, using modern technology. And we thought that by recreating this figurine, we could also do some comparanda with other objects in other collections and try to exchange the attributes and focus on different aspects of this research, such as materiality, scale, function and symbolism and of course since i am the education officer i would use these replicas as educational resources and try to see how people react to out to actually holding um our, our replicas since our pedagogies are closely linked to object teaching and object learning um, resources so here is a picture of all of us doing photogrammetry. Um, so we were quite didactic and we taught ourselves. There are many tutorials on the internet. And we also had uh, Laura Benito as uh, I think it was the first training that we had on photogrammetry. And um, it included the staff, but also included volunteers. It included Erasmus interns and Europe interns and work placements from Reading College. So it was a really nice group that we made. We have a, a lighthouse where we uh, place the object and then take pictures of the object um, 
going around 360 degrees and from different angles. So that would give us a large number of photographies that would then be merged. Yes, they will then be merged uh, thanks to uh, a software uh, that we have, uh, photo, photo scan by IGSoft. And the thing is that coming together with the training and with everyone's schedules and getting our hands on the license of the program, all of that was very time consuming. So we used previous 3D models that were created in a project called VACT that was to assess the usefulness of virtual models and teaching. And in that project, of course, was involved James Lloyd. Um, so uh, they, he, among other students and volunteers, uh, photographed this figurine that we're going to call, just for the sake of it, uh, tambourine player. And another one. Um, so these are the 3D printers that we have. Uh, the one on your right is the Q Pro printer, which is a professional 3D printer. And the other one was built up by our PhD uh, student, um, Luca Otonello, uh, who kindly gave permission to use uh, this 3D printer. And we tried to print as many figurines as we could in different textures, in different sizes, in different weights, in different colors, as you can see, and we played uh, with recreating uh, an artificial base, as you can see, because most of them are, are broken at the, at the base. Um, so you can see that some of the quality are good, uh, some others not so bad. In the end, uh, they all uh, serve to the purpose of being uh, helped by people and by families and students and master students and everyone who would pop in the Yule Museum. So we even made molds. Uh, so get ready when uh, the pandemic allow us to go back to the office. We're going to have Cypriot chocolates. So um, yeah, um, be ready for that. So we try to use all these resources and to try these resources in many events inside the Yore and outside the Yore Museum. And we gave people uh, all these research toys, as I like to call them. And we saw that they started playing and we tried some slow motion animation. You're going to see our next step. And that is that because lots of people consider the tambourine player as such as a really as a real tambourine player as a real musician we noticed that in other collections there were other musicians uh, with the same uh, from the same chronology and from the same style so it was another camelaga figurines as these are called but holding different lyres or different aulas so, so uh, we research their musical um, overview in ancient Cyprus and we realized that they used two different lyres as we see here so we designed them using a uh, mishmax and then we inserted the instrument where the original tambourine was and here we got the votives all the musicians you can see that um, we try uh, to recreate as many tambourine players as we could uh, using different techniques. And we also have other figurines, Cypriot figurines, but of a different style. All of these are molded of, uh, within female representations, uh, wearing jewelry and fancy dresses, playing a small tambourine. We can see all some of the animations that children and students came up with. So these are warriors dancing with musicians. And of course, um, it's not by chance that this links to a very ancient myth of the warrior as a musician too, such as Achilles, if we go, yeah. So here we got a, an extremely ancient representation from the 11th century BC. Um, we can see the, the, the warrior with a very long sword uh, playing the lyre at the same time. 
Um, so if we go to the next one, we're going to see the very same or a similar representation of people dancing among musicians in this Cypre-Phoenician bowls. Uh, and these bowls were extremely um, popular, not only in Cyprus, but in, in ancient Greece too. Um, so of course, these are our conclusions that when it comes to using them as uh, didactic resources, they are great and they favor interaction and they favor object-based learning. And uh, it's great to use these uh, research toys with different background students. And you can see that somehow, despite all the different theories and despite the, the animations that they made, their backgrounds, anything, they all came up with the same conclusions as the scholars have come during the last three decades. So it's really eye-opening. Um, so this, uh, this project, uh, 3D Cypress, led to another emerging program that we have right now because while presenting this uh, Cyprus project in the Digital Classics Day that we hosted last year, uh, we were visited by two archaeologists that were part of the um, South Oxfordshire Archaeology Group that are excavating this Roman villa, the Gay Hampton Roman villa, which is near Gorin on Thames. And as you can see, it's a really nice one, a really nice site uh, from the third and fourth uh, century BC. And they've been digging the, the villa since 1993. And um, in the cesspit, two motor beakers were found, which is amazing. And they although they were fragmented, they are very well preserved. And so you have here the 3D models that the archaeologists there made. Um, two of them, one the Yuvat beaker and the other one uh, Amandida uh, beaker. And because they didn't have access to, uh, to a 3D printer, they kindly asked us um, to collaborate with them. So what we did is that we 3D print them in a scale of one to one. So that's me holding the 3D replica, as you can see, and you can see there is a hole uh, which tries to convey the idea that it's a fragmented vase, but as you can see, it's filled with material because it was the only way that we could properly pr 3D print these vase because if we try to print it as a hollow vase. We would need extra support outside and it would absolutely change uh, the shape of the, of the vase. Uh, of course, this um, emerging research project is going to be great to, again, to try the object-based teaching methodologies, to continue with this new methodological process, to actually observe thinking, describe drawing process, to do comparanda with the rest of speakers in Europe and in the UK, uh, of course, to analyze materiality, scale, function, symbolism, and to delve into economy, religion in Roman Britain. Uh, we are working towards uh, coming up with a temporary exhibit in the Your Museum whenever it's possible with more material from the villa and our 3D uh, replicas. But my ultimate goal is to make the Your Museum Roman again and to bring it back to its Romano-British roots that Amy mentioned already. Uh, that was the name from 1914 onwards of the museums. Thank you, Claudina. Um, so if you visit our new collections web pages at collections.reading.ac.uk slash your hyphen museum, you'll see a research tab on the top menu of each page. And feel free to click on that tab and explore via, or explore the rest of the site too, if you wish. Um, but especially via our, what we've distilled to nine themes that embrace the resources in our archives and our other collections and address our current and potential projects. Um, most importantly, they present uh, the intrepid researcher with a range of topics that stretch far beyond mere antiquarian interest um, into art history, ancient and modern, historiography, reception studies, childhood and pedagogy, digital and other technologies, 
music and even travel. And we didn't touch on that much, um, but as you know, Rachel Mayers has um, put some of that material out um, on a display. But as well as histories, ancient and modern, imperial, regional, and local, and throughout issues related to a sense of identity, the identities of those who peopled antiquity and um, those who acquired antiquity, as well as, and most importantly, perhaps, the, its interpreters, and all of them revealing interesting stories that can be understood through the study of ancient things, as well as much else. Thank you.